Welcome back to The Urban Monk. Dr. Pedram Shojai here, sitting in Southern California where it's sunny and yummy and I'm happy to be home. Uh, I want to talk about a subject today that, that needs a lot of attention uh, and it's called compassion. Uh, we're living in a world right now where uh, you know we're, we've kind of lost compassion for the environment, we've lost compassion for immigrants, we've lost compassion for a lot of things. Uh, and, and a lot of it has to do with losing compassion for ourselves. Uh, and, and so it's interesting times and there are uh, you know all sorts of memes being floated out, out there right now. We're in a very kind of regressive pendulum swing where, where people are, are, are holding up. Uh, so I have some stats here for you. Um, a child is bullied every seven minutes in our world. Uh, the uh, American business turning to uh, basically having health problems due to stress is about $300 billion a year. 160,000 children miss school each, each uh, day for fear of being bullied in the United States. Uh, fuck that. Um, oh, over a third of Americans have said they experience inclinivity at work, uh, in, in, incivility at work, uh, and 26% of them have quit their jobs because of it. And one out of 10 kids drop out of school altogether because of bullying. And while over 80% of 18 to 25 year olds uh, chose uh, getting rich as one of their generation's most important goals, only 30% ch uh, chose helping others in need. What the hell is going on? Um, so this is uh, important because uh, if there's ever been a time to look at the need for compassion, uh, now would be a good one. Uh, so my guest today, uh, Chris Cook, uh, Dr. Chris Cook, uh, is the author of a book called The Compassionate Achiever, How Helping Others Fuels Success. And I love this because it's very much in line with this entire arc of conscious capitalism that we've been following with the prosperity movie and really saying, okay, look, you know, it's like, well, yeah, that, that sounds great, but well, you know, what about when you get a real job? And, and so, you know, I think that we've kind of come out of this duality consciousness of either you're a good person or a Wall Street bank anchor uh, and there's this really interesting place where we're coming together in the middle. We're, we're not adolescents anymore. We're starting to grow into adults. So let's have an adult conversation about not being a dick and being good at life and also being able to be a good neighbor and all of it. Yeah? Welcome, yes. to, the show. Welcome to the show, Chris. <laughs> Thank you. What an introduction. Wow. And yeah, those, stat, those stats are alarming. And the, the problem is, is that Unfortunately, many of us know those stats personally, right? And mm -hmm. and that's where it, it, the rubber hits hits the road, and it's in the everyday life. And when we're talking about getting a real job, right? I, I learned a lot of these lessons about compassion and the importance of compassion in achieving whatever goal you think you want to achieve. That compassion is really the the key for making that success sustainable. You know, we all know, you know, some work jerks that may have gotten to the top. But I'm not saying that work jerks are not going to get to the top every once in a while. They will win some battles. But that's also life. I, but the compassionate achievers will win the battles and sustain the success a lot longer. Because a lot of those work jerks fade out. They flame out. They burn out. They've cut so many bridges. They cut so many ropes to so many other people that when they fall, because we all inevitably fall, there's no one there to help them. Mm. For those compassion achievers, when they start to stumble, there's usually someone there to steady them, to help them out, to get them back on the path. And and I think it's right in front of us all the time. We just don't see it. You know, I, I've heard, you know, that Cook, you got to be ruthless. From my high school football coach, from my <laughs> drill sergeant in in boot camp, and they were all insanely wrong. And you know, we we teach that from kindergarten on up, if you think about it. And I think uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, right, the, the guy at the social contract, he had it right. He said, we're all born with natural compassion. His, his words, his phrase, natural compassion, we're all born with it. But through society, we unlearn it. Mm. And, and if, if you think about it, our, our kids play king of the hill on playgrounds. And when I was in the country of Estonia on a Fulbright teaching, I had to explain realism, you know, this kind of Machiavelli push down someone else to put, you know, put yourself on top idea of politics, realism politics, kind of like what we have right now in the, in the Trump administration. And as one of the theories, and I could tell, I said to the students, um, and they're from all over Europe, I said, all right, think of it like King of the Hill. And one young Polish scholar i'll never forget her she raised her hand she goes dr cook what's king of the hill <laughs> and i had explained 
to 119 uh, European college students that on American playgrounds, they play a game that we all play where you push someone down in order to stay on top. And they were just aghast and because they don't play it. They don't play that game and they don't play kill the carrier. And she raised her hand later and she goes, and this is the unfortunate part that explains so much about the United States. Yeah. So we have a lot of work to do and it's on our end. You know, yeah. it's, it's what we allow. It's what we teach. You know, what's funny is um, looking at this whole kind of arc of capitalism and where it's come from. You know, you go to kind of the, the, the founding father of sorts, the guy, you know, Adam Smith, who, you know, uh, you know wrote, you know, kind of the, the, the Bible of capitalism. Everyone kind of, kind of quotes him as, you know, the, the kind of founder of modern capitalism. And he mentions that his first book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, was an absolute prerequisite it to the a wealth of the wealth of nations which is what you know everyone took and ran with and then Milton Friedman and all these guys kind of you know turned into this kind of uh, parasitic system that just extracts wealth and you know might makes right and king of the hill and all this and that that's not what the founding father of modern capitalism was even talking about it was about moral sentiments and 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 being a good person and so where where the hell did we lose the script here i mean is there like a historical <laughs> piece to this i mean how, how did this go so far into this really aggressive kind of patriarchal uh world view uh against compassion i think you know I, there's many different factors so i think one of the biggest factors is a misinterpretation of one of the guys i have on my back shelf here um darwin when Darwin right, came out with On the Origin of Species and then um, people took, especially here in the United States, they took his work and misinterpreted it. And so his hypotheses, right, he never said, by the way, and never phrased survival of the fittest. It was a guy named Spencer who did that. So, But he hypothesized, Darwin did hypothesize something like that. And But if you read the rest of his research, especially Darwin's The Descent of Man, specifically chapters two, four, and five of The Scent of Man, he is very clear he takes down any support for the survival of the fittest. And mm. what, what's amazing is that we are taught, and it was you know, interpreted as his hypothesis was what the real deal was about. But if you look at all his research, because we don't get assigned that, at least I didn't when I went to high school, I got his hypothesis, I didn't get his research. Mm. All his research shows, and, and this, is, this is Darwin, this is true Darwin. So we've got the bumper sticker, we've been taught the bumper sticker version of Darwin, but this is the real Darwin. He said that the species that will move up the evolutionary ladder the most efficiently and effectively is the species that has the highest number of, and check this out, this is his word, the highest number of his members as sympathetic to each other. Is that Darwin that you were taught? Because it wasn't Darwin I was taught. <laughs> <laughs> and he's very clear on, uh, on that in the descent of man. And and Paul Ekman um, has, you know, the famous psychologist, he, he's he's taken Darwin too, and he, he says that sympathy is basically means three things in different contexts for Darwin. It, it, it means um, altruism, empathy, and guess what? Compassion. And and all of Darwin's work, his research after On the Origin of Species shows that, but we're not taught that. And, and so we've misinterpreted, misinterpreted one of the key, I think, literary structures, pillars of American society. All right, we have the Constitution, right, that I think is one of them. But Darwin is another. How many times have someone thrown out to you, you know, you got, you, survival of the fittest. And when you ask mm -hmm. them to describe what Darwin meant, they get it completely wrong. We all did. I was even taught wrong. Um, by some of the great teachers. And I think we just take the time to go back and actually read what the great thinkers were saying. And you were just doing that, you know, with uh, Wealth of Nations and Adam Smith. If we just take the time and actually go back to the sources rather than have people interpret it for us, I think we find something a little bit different than what we're taught. Totally. I mean, sadly, I got to kind of reference this, you know, uh, you know, there was the early era of Christianity, and then, you know, the Romans were like, hey, if you can't beat them, join them. And then they suddenly turned it into the imperial religion and, and took all these kind of doctrines of this nice guy named Jesus. And then, you know, went around basically, you know, stabbing heathen and, and, and planting their flags. And it's like, it's almost like Darwin and all these other kind of thinkers have become, you know, kind of productized and turned into like little, like, you know, memes for, you know, the vehicle of, of imperialism in America. It's it's weird. It's like the king of the hill is like I just I just need little quotes to, to keep substantiating what what it is that I do right and I'm a, and I'm a bully. 
<laughs> well, and and that's the problem, right? So the the people who were seeking power, um, you know, Lord Acton said, you know, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts as, absolutely. But I, you know, and I've been thinking about this lately. Um, Scientific Mind just came out with an, a, a new issue, and and there's some great stuff on there about power, and I, it got me to thinking about that Acton quote, the Lord Acton quote, that's that's pretty famous, and. I was thinking that, you know, if you achieved power through compassion, would it corrupt? Absolutely. And I don't think it would. Mm. And I think we forget that, that, you know, when you, you build something, you should be, it should be built to last. And, you know, you can go back to refrigerators nowadays. I remember my grandmother's refrigerator. You couldn't kill the thing, right? Mm. You could take an ice pick to it and it would still, it would still chug along. Now, you know, things are made where they're made because, and it's something that you were you started the show with, you know, that someone wants to make money from someone else. They're not necessarily caring about someone else. Mm. And I think that when you start with the idea of compassion for the people around you and your workers, everything moves better. Everything mm. is more solid. Everything, the structure, is it, it's harder to break. But when you're pitting one against another, it's the easiest thing to break any type of structure. Ask any great team that. Uh, and it, it's it's all right in front of us, but we seem to put blinders on because we think in order to achieve success, we have to do it either by ourselves or overcoming someone else rather than doing it with someone else. And, you know, being in my, my time in the service, that's the opposite. We're taught in the service that the team is crucial, right? And you're only as strong as your weakest link. And so you help everyone. And it's one of the hardest things coming out of the military is that, you know, literally leave no man behind. We, we didn't. Even if we didn't like the person, we still had their back. But when you come out of the service, I, I restored cars before I had kids. Um, and now I, I just build kids. Um, <laughs> but I, I had old cars and I would break, they would break down because I would re- be restoring them. And I just remembered, you know, in the service around post, there's always someone willing to help me push or give me a tow. When I got out in the civilian world, I got the bird. I got the soprano salute, mm. right? I didn't get help. And it's one of the hardest things as a vet to come out of um, is that non-caring environment, believe it or not, in the service compared to what we have as a society. And it's heartbreaking to a lot of us. It's really funny. My, my, my wife has this story when she came, you know, like she was like a 16-year-old girl came from Iran and she had a, a, her, her car break down. And people gave her the same thing. It was a 16-year-old girl like crying. And she said, you know, back in Iran, and you know, Iran's the devil obviously, right? Because they're, they're, they're horrible. Back in Iran, if, if, a, if a girl's car broke down, every single person within a half a mile would be there helping this damsel in distress. You know what I mean? And it's just like, that's what decency is. And like, she was, she almost moved back right then and there because she was just like, what oh, the, man. what the fuck <laughs> is this? Like, who, how, how are these humans, right? And it, it just, it was, it was, she couldn't reconcile the lack of just kind of basic ethics that happens on a, on a cultural level here on the streets of America. You know, right. you, see, you see it in small town America, so right. right? Yeah. Yeah, it's so right. And it's one of the reasons I love, you know, um, Albert Camus' The Plague. And I pick it up every so often and I read it during the summer because it's, it's about basic, the power of basic civility, the, mm. the power of kindness, the power of compassion, mm. and how it can overcome anything if we put that forward first. Right? And, and we... We, we, we've forgotten that and we, we've been in such a rush about everything we do, we've forgotten that in that rush, we're leaving so many important things behind. Mm. And by the time we get to where we think we're gonna go, it's usually a hollow shell that we have left because we have no one really to share it with. Mm. And you know, we see it all the time. You see it in businesses like Enron, right? Enron was looking for to raise its own bottom line by driving electricity into the ground. Right. And and they were supposedly the model of businesses and people use them as a case study of what you should do. But it was pure greed. And where are they now? Dead. They don't exist anymore. But you have the Patagonias of the world who give back to the community, who have the sustainable success for a long time. So even people who think they know economics and think that, you know, it's, it's a zero sum game. First off, they didn't read Smith correctly, as you, as you pointed out. And even in The Wealth of Nations, he devotes a chapter, a chapter to the importance of education and funding of education on every level, right? And that doesn't usually get brought out of the book. And my, unfortunately, in my own, own town, uh, someone tried to bring out Adam Smith, and so I brought mine with me all, 
our peg deer and they wanted to cut education using Adam Smith. And I was like, no, actually, Adam Smith said this. And we, 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 we overlook a lot of people, a lot of us do, ideas that don't fit into our little framework. Instead of having discussions like we're having right now, people are yelling at each other. Mm. People are bypassing those ideas. And I think if we, we connect a little bit more and we have compassion for one another, and compassion, the first step in that is listening. Right? If we, we don't listen, we listen. If we do, it's listen to reply, not listen to learn, not listening to understand. That's where we first trip up, man. That, that, that's where the first mistake happens. So learning to listen means actually listening so that you can get an understanding of the position that this person is coming from. Exactly. And not, not, not formulating your, your retort or your answer right then and there. You got it, right? And it's not taking your perspective on the problem, right? You're not the important thing. Mm. The person who's speaking, who you're trying to help, mm. that is the most important anything in the room. And to, you know, when I'm talking with somebody or talking with students, I'm a professor at a state university here, you know, I clear my desk in front of me and that is actually a reset button for me. Mm. So to, I make sure I don't answer the phone. I make sure so if the phone rings, if I have a student in front of me, they're everything to me. We don't do that as much anymore. Mm. And, and I think when you do that, you pick up on subtle bodily cues, everything from eye movement to what they do with their hands. And everything that they do and a person does tells you something, even the silence does. But we don't, we don't allow it to happen because we don't, we don't have the patience or we don't give enough time to the idea, to the concept of listening. And you're right, it's to get their entire perspective about it. Hmm. So if I stop, stop formulating what I'm gonna say, stop coming from my own storefront and say this, this human in front of me, is it, let, let, them, let, me, you know, let them educate me about their position. Just listen. And then yes, at that point, you allow yourself to possibly understand, presumably, right? Where, where yes. they're actually coming from. Yes, and, but for me, listening includes, and I know this is gonna be a little paradoxical, includes questioning. Sure. In, right? Well, well, well fur further questioning helps you understand where they're coming from. So yeah, it's not a retort. I mean, listening could mean questioning them for hours and hours, to, in my opinion, right? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I think great questions you know, help, and I talk about this in the book, they're, they're like photographs because they bring out the essence of a person or, and, or they're a problem. And you know, Ansel Adams was one of the best, in my opinion, uh, on that. And I think when you formulate questions, it helps people, not only for you to get an understanding, but but if you if you do it right, it helps them understand their own problem better, right? And so a lot of times they can get to the answers. So they're coming to you maybe for help, but you help them find the answers uh, through themselves by by questions. In doing so, not only have you respected, to, respected them and their space and actually allowed for them to, to be themselves and speak without having to deal with a defensive combatant type of person on the other side, now that you're, you're showing them respect, which is something that I think is really missing uh, you know, in any conversation around here. And then you're allowed to be, you basically open up the bridge to connect with them as a human. And that's the hope, right? And, mm. and when, when that respect, Two, not only goes to the questioning, but it goes to their silence. Don't fill in their silence. Mm. You know, let them have time to formulate because we're all different. And, and sometimes people need to take that extra, extra time and allow it. Allow the awkwardness of the silence to be. Respect it because mm. that's what they're doing too, right? And, and respect that silence and, 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 and watch them and learn from them about that because you, you can see when someone is either trying to figure out what they're going to say or someone who's stonewalling you right and then it depends on from from that information you can then go into an either you know different types of questions and and i think we need to have respect of not only what they're saying and of the person but of what they're not saying too mm -hmm.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's political sensitivities, there's shame, there's, you know, some staggering percentage of people, uh, you know, in America alone have been molested, right? And like, you know, there, there's just stuff that like you just don't know about people. So you just assume someone's being a jerk or someone's got a position because of something, right? And, and there's just, there's so much pain right under the surface that people are hiding too that, you know, they can't, they can't. I mean, who are you? I, I don't trust anybody with, the, with this deep, dark secret. And that's, that's you know, that's what I learned as a physician is just, man, you shut up and you hold, you hold court and just, you know, allow it to come out as it would, right? Organically, right. it has to naturally surface if they feel the trust and, and the love right. there. Right, because they have to, in order to, you know, to address any problem, you really have to understand it. And they have to, sometimes they blocked it, like you were getting to, they were, they're blocking their own ideas about it mm -hmm. because it's maybe too painful. Mm -hmm. And so they have to get a more holistic understanding of the problem, and it takes time, because you gotta work through the pain, and you gotta respect that. Yeah. Uh, and if you don't respect it, you're not gonna get too far. That's it. Yeah, I mean, good luck. Good luck getting anything out of them. <laughs> right. So right. yeah, I, I got a I got a kind of a, a difficult question, um, and it has to do with kind of compartmentalized compassion. And so huh. I'll give you a couple examples. Is you know, everyone at church, man, I love I love the people that I go to church with. We take care of each other. That guy's car gets pulled over. Everyone jumps out. We bake them cookies. It's great, right? <laughs> It, we're, we're all together in this, right? Or we're the chosen people, or, or even in your mm -hmm. case, right? This is my platoon. You know, we're, we're only as strong as our weakest link. But sh fuck those guys. Let's shoot them, right? <laughs> and, and, and so, how do you, how does one step out of of that? Like these insular compassion bubbles, where it's like, okay, us, us together. But it's still not us, us, right? It's still not the big us. And so to uh, me, that, that bridge is really the one that, that is still needing to be crossed uh, you know, culturally, especially in these day, this day and age. I mean, people are killing each other over the same God in all the same books right. uh, you know, in different languages. Right, okay. So this, this is a little bit more nuanced. I wouldn't call that specialized or compartmentalized feeling for another as compassion. Compassion, I wrote a piece called Patriots of Humanity, right? I think the true patriots are people who protect all of humanity. I think every person is sacred. And if you don't get that, don't understand it, I don't think you understand compassion. Amen. Compassion, right? Compassion is not that compartment in my eyes. I use those as examples of kind of sure. the platoon. It's just getting the idea across. Sure. If anything, you're feeling the same thing as someone else in in those instances as a compartment that's empathy mm. right and so empathy to me is a lot like fire um fire can warm you up right as long as you control the that that fire that empathy but empathy can burn you down because if empathy is about having the same feeling as someone else right or stepping in their shoes and sometimes when they're in depression that can take you down mm. right and so you know in the nursing literature back in the 1980s they they call what nurses were going through compassion burnout we now know through neuroscience but that's not the case it's actually a misnomer it's empathy burnout because uh dr tanya singer has shown over and over again that we use different neural pathways when we think in terms of empathetic way versus a compassionate way and a compassionate way is a much more holistic it's not you, know, you don't have to have empathy to have compassion mm -hmm. i think it can help but there are some kids that develop empathy later in life and then if you're trying to have them build social emotional learning or emotional intelligence and, and they find out that uh, I don't have empathy, that means I can't go on any further. It, 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 you're stopping any type of development, any type of growth. And we've seen, and Dr. Tanya Singer has shown this through through her work, that you can have compassion without empathy. And, and for some people that's really hard to understand because they, they, they think that the understanding comes through having the same feeling right, as, as another. But you don't have to have the feelings. right? Um, Buddhist monks in China who get imprisoned, you know, when they're interviewed after they're released, you hear them say they have compassion for their captors. Do you ever hear them say they have empathy for mm -hmm. their compassion? No. Mm -hmm. Right. So you just have to kind of look at, at, at real world as well as what the science is saying. And you can see the nuanced differences. And, and I think when you have you're saying that, you know, you know, these are my brothers and sisters and, and, and you're not. I actually think that's more on the empathy side mm -hmm. because compassion doesn't have that. that it's universal. That, yes, it is. And I think you're a true patriot when you're a patriot of humanity. Mm -hmm. Amen. 
Amen. Thank you for that. Yeah, that's, you know, that's a big deal in, in our world. You know, there's a lot of, you know, tribalism still yes. in, the, in these, you know, kind of compassion bubbles where, you I know, and, and I think, what was his name? Paul Bloom, was it? The, uh, yes. Against Empathy. We had him on the show a, a while ago, several months ago. And it was, again, he was just going right after this empathy thing saying, no, the empathy is, is BS. What you really want is to cultivate true compassion, right? Yeah, I, I'm kind of in the middle. So you have Simon Baron Cohen who thinks empathy is key, right? And you have Paul Bloom who thinks empathy is BS. I'm somewhere in the middle. I, I think that empathy can be something constructive as long as you control it. It can be destructive, just like fire mm -hmm. can, right? Fire mm -hmm. can warm, warm you up or it can burn you down. Right? And I think empathy is that way. I think compassion is that key, that, 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 that kind of, if you have that compassionate mindset, I think you can rock and roll mm -hmm. and you don't have to worry about burning something down. So taking the compassionate mindset, and so you know, we've got, you've got the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu over your left shoulder, hanging out with Darwin and Einstein. Um, uh, had that guy on the show too, actually, not, not Einstein, uh, the author of the Book of Joy. Uh, and uh, you know, so, so we have some really good teachers. You know, we have the words of the Buddha, we have the words of Jesus, we have a lot of teachers that, that talk about compassion. Even Adam Smith freaking talked about compassion, right? And you know, who knew? No one quoted that. Um, and, and so there's a lot of that but then this this kind of nuanced new kind of walk with achievement and compassion uh, vibe this is really where you know I think this whole conscious capitalism movement this whole kind of new birth of a kind of a purpose driven capitalism a purpose driven kind of uh, modern human is starting to emerge uh, it's just the, the, co the cover of fast company had a uh, had uh, what's his face from Facebook on it, you know, just this week, just talking about how you know the, the true entrepreneur um, is is really the person who's actually got a mission and a purpose, and that drives everything. Um, and so it's it's a big part of the narrative, right? It's a big part of the narrative. And so, how does one become a, a compassionate achiever? Well, that's one of the reasons I wrote the book because we had a lot of we have a lot of research that says that it's an important part, right? And so. You have um, Give and Take by Adam Grant that, that, that was very popular about that, but there was no kind of how-to to, to do it and kind of basic steps that you can take every day. And I just want to be clear, but as a compassionate achiever, I'm not saying that we're saints because <laughs> we all have different sins that we, that we do, right? And uh, you know, I don't know how people can judge another because, man, you have to look in a mirror and uh, none of us are perfect. And I'm not saying that a compassionate achiever is saintly, but I'm saying that a compassionate achiever will make a better world if we, 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 we look after compassion. So the steps that I have are basically four steps, right? And think of the name Luca, L-U-C-A, right? And Luca... It, in many different languages, it means bringer of light. But then in science, and that's where I, I first got it, it's last universal common ancestor of all life on Earth. Um, so when you put those two, you know, two together, you know, it, it just happened to fit my, my, my formula of listen to learn, understand to know what you need to do to help, connect to capabilities, and then act, literally act to solve. Just don't point a person in the direction and say, good luck, you know, rock on. Um, help them out, actually do something about it and there are each each of those four steps i d devote three chapters uh to to building up basic everyday skills that 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 you can do so for listening for example um i i literally do this i listen to podcasts to people's to people <laughs> whose ideas i don't agree with but i force myself to listen all the way through and to listen and to understand how they're getting there and when I have disagreements, maybe, or um, there's something at work and they're coming from that perspective, I at least have an understanding of where they're coming from. And I can use a part of their ideas to help them see where I'm coming from. Because if I'm just throwing my ideas in front of them, it's, it's going to be, you know, Captain America. It's going to be a shield up, mm -hmm. right? And it's not going to be, uh, you know, something that's accepting. So I have to learn about their ideas and and that's that's where you know I founded the debate team on campus and I got in trouble for a little bit because people said it's unethical for you to have students argue the opposite of what they personally believe and I said well how do they personally believe something that they don't know all the arguments it, they, they were indoctrinated then right they don't right. know everything so you know and I do this in my classroom and I teach political economy as a counterintelligence agent during the Cold War 
I am at least one week, more than that, a Marxist. And I give the Marxist viewpoint. Another week, I'm a mercantilist. Another week, I'm a classical liberal. I try to give the arguments that are the strongest of each school because every school does have some credence um, to it. And I've changed over my lifetime in terms of what I believe was stronger by the different things that I learned from others. And if you can't constantly learn, if you're shutting down everything in front of you because you think you know the answers and you're not listening, so you're not understanding, I don't know how you can have compassion for yourself, never mind compassion for anybody else, right? And, and that success is about connecting new knowledge. The, that, that connection of new ideas and new knowledge leads to understanding or in other cases, wisdom, right? And the more you can connect ideas and the more you're open to connecting those ideas, that's key. And so I go through practical steps like that, you know, that anybody can do at any time uh, about how to improve their listening, their understanding, their connecting capabilities, and then their actions to solve. And I have a paradoxical one in there, some, a chapter on non-doing actually. Hmm. Well, I'm a Taoist, so you can't so you can't it. scare me with that. Yeah, <clears throat> um, the this this notion you've got me really intrigued here of getting people, like say in a speech and debate club, to learn and argue the opposite viewpoint uh, to the point where they would you know have a compelling argument and understand how to argue that. How long does it take? Like, how do you give them a week? Like, how long does it take to like you know prep for this so that you could actually effectively get your point across in in the debate and, and show people how, how this this process works? Well, what I normally do is I try to um, so when the students when I was doing this, I'd have the students fill out kind of a questionnaire about what their interests were. And so I would actually pick topics that they personally love. And then, you know, I get an angle of where they're coming from. And so I would have them research both sides of what they were passionate about. And so when you do that, it doesn't take very long at all. Right? I, I started off the wrong way when I first did it. I just signed them something. And then it took like three weeks. Mm. And when I gave them things that they loved, duh, right, it took two days uh, for them to, to get rock and rolling. Dr. Cook, can we do this? Can we do it now? And you know it's 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 interesting. It doesn't take very long. It doesn't take very long at all. Okay, so so an example is okay. If I took some avid environmentalist who's just like you know going for it and just you know bleeding heart liberal, going for you know every, everything you know like lying across the, the the chainsaws on the trees and all this, and said, okay, I need you to argue the other side. Yes. What 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 does that person do? So what usually comes out, out, out of that is a combination of that they see that some type of development is necessary. And then they get into this phrase, I think it's a key phrase, sustainable development, right? Mm -hmm. So that not all development is bad, that there's some development that's good, mm -hmm. some development that's not good, that is mm -hmm. bad, right? And then how do you figure that out? You know, what are the steps to figure it out? And each thing, you know, I did my doctoral dissertation actually on fresh water, fresh water around the world. And for me, you know, different, the different contexts matter, just like global climate change matters, right? Some places where it's dry, it's gonna get drier. Where it's wet, it's gonna get wetter in global climate change, right? And so it's to understand those nuances. And so once you sit down, right, every different region of the United States, of the world, they are different. And so you have to understand the context that, that you're in. And that's what I want the students to understand. Don't go in with your preconceptions. Mm -hmm. Because if you're going in with your preconceptions, you're gonna miss answers. And, and then, this is another key thing, that an idea or a plan that failed in one instance doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily gonna fail in another spot, in another context, right? And there's this great Peranda's paradox in, in math um, that shows you that, you know, a losing strategy in, it, to achieve one goal, it, 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 say it's strategy A, it's a losing strategy. And you have strategy B, and it's a losing strategy to achieve that goal as well. What Peranda's paradox has shown is that when you put those strategies alternating, when you weave them together, they actually create a successful strategy of achieving the goal. But in our society, if it's considered a failure, we it's wash out. wash our hands. Yeah, mm. and, and it's mind-boggling to me because we have so many resources and and human capital, right? That you know we we give them one shot and you're done. But if you know anything, right, and you, you certainly do because you're in medicine, you know that inventions and innovations came not out of successes, out of failures. Tragic ones oftentimes. And yes. wars and, yeah, mass units. And so we, we have to set up, 
you know, and our schools are not set up to do this. They're set up to jump through tests, right? So I purposely set up my classes to this day. So my honor students, the type A students, I run the honors program at, at my university, they have to fail. There's no way they can do it. Yeah. I want them to be able to fail in front of me. Mm. And it's not the end of the world. And you can pick yourself up and you can actually do something better than what you thought you could do. Mm. Because they haven't. They're really great at jumping through hoops. That's why they're honor students. But in the real world, as you know, it's not that cut and dry. No. And I, I rather have them go through that process, that pain with me, where they're not losing someone's life, right, as a doctor, where they're not losing a, a billion dollars of, of someone's retirement account. Right, uh, many people's retirement account, like it happened in 2008. I'd rather have them understand that that happens now, and that makes you a better person, a better learner, for that. Yeah. And so it's to set those things up, and we can do that. You know, it's just making it a priority. Yeah, we do that on the mat all the time in martial arts studios, right? You, you know, you, you work it out on the mat, so in reality, you don't need to. And if you exactly. do, then you know how to how to handle it. So, um, you know, this is a, a big loaded question. Here is we're we're living in a, a a very interesting time where we're in kind of a mimetic polarity war, right? Where you know people people are fighting over you know actually the nature of reality, like that. Oh, what what, what you're saying is fake news, and and you know I just don't accept that. So, what how can we use this methodology to, to really get these kind of polarized sides. And when you create polarity, you create all sorts of opportunity for, you know, financial gain. I mean, listen, the warmongers are happy right now. There's all sorts of shit happening in the world uh, by using the same kind of divide and conquer formula amongst the people, right? And so yeah. what, what in this in this context of your book and your, your work, is, is the way forward to have a compassionate dialogue start to open up and, and, and get people to understand each other's positions and, and soften? Right, so, wow, that is a loaded question. I know, I know. <laughs> um, I'm making you work, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right, that's cool. <laughs> um, well, I mean, we can talk anything from economics to uh, international, right? Because one of the things that I do in the honors program is that we have 4.0 students from high school who do not get into our honors program because I'm going to make it simple. If you're a jerk, if you're off for your own self-interest, you're not getting into this honors program. This honor means not only academic excellence, but that you have honor, you cool. have ethics, you have morality. I don't want our university's name tied to anyone who will go and do what they did in the 2008 economic crisis. You can go hopefully somewhere far away, mm -hmm. <laughs> not near us. And so, you know, I'll have parents come in, you know, my son or daughter is a 4.0 and I said yes and I interviewed them and I asked them a question. It looks like you just did a merit badge thing. It looks like you didn't really go to the um, soup kitchen on a regular basis or you just went there and you'll see them when they're by themselves, just give me a blank stare and some will just actually pick up and walk out. Because I'll ask them, you know, show me that I'm wrong. Prove to me that I'm wrong, right? Because I could be misinterpreting something. Mm -hmm. And I'll say that to them. And there'll be some like, yeah, okay, you're right. And then they'll walk out. Wow. And that's the shame, right? That's, wow. that's the part we, we don't call people out mm. for, you know, what we believe is not kind or not compassionate. And, and I think we, when, when someone treats someone else in a non-sacred way, we can't be bystanders. And we've become, in many instances, bystanders. We, we've become watchers. We've become watchers to the news instead of actually getting out there and doing things. And so, you know, this March for Science tomorrow, I think is awesome. Because now you have the scientific community going out there. And what was that inspired by? The Women's March, right? Mm -hmm. So you got these groups that are coming together that are inspired. I actually see more hope and optimism, you know, in, in terms of our country and people coming together and people working together on the gra grassroots level, like we haven't done, haven't been able to do before. Right? And I, um, one of my uh, mentors in school was Bob Putnam. He wrote a famous book called Bowling Alone about how in civil society, right, we're stepping away from each other. And he uses the famous example of bowling leagues. Um, when my grandfather went bowling, it was a big deal. You got it all together with your friends. And, 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 and Dr. Putnam was saying, if you go to bowling alleys now, you see these lonely guys bowling by themselves, hmm. right? And he says, that's where you get him up bowling alone. We're starting to be individual. We're not having shows like this that bring up these topics, right? And try to bring together different types and groups of people from different perspectives to show you 
how compassion is actually more powerful than the self-interest idea, than the selfish perspective, right? And we don't talk about this. So I'm willing to talk when I, and I have, and you can tell when there's somebody in the crowd that doesn't buy this, especially Darwin. And I'll say, you pick anything you want about Darwin on any topic that you want. You start the discussion. I'll listen to you and I'll ask you a few questions and then you can come back and forth to me. But I, I want to, I'm going to hear you out. I just want you to hear me out. But you start it. And I give them the floor. And they have the power, right? And I'll, I'll ask questions to them to show them that I'm listening to them. And then I'm trying to understand their perspective. And okay, nine times out of ten, I'm not saying every time, right? There are some people that I, you just can't. I, I try. And in maybe in a, another week or two or year, um, they might come around. But many more people than not actually are open into that dialogue, right? And then, you know, for someone who talks about compassion, someone who hasn't looked at my biography, you know, they don't know what they how could a comp, how could a counterintelligence agent during the Cold War be compassionate? That's what I get sometimes. Mm -hmm. They see it as opposite of one another, and I want to explore that. That should be something that we should talk about because in the book I interviewed, we called him C. In you know, James Bond movies, he's famously called M, right? But it's actually chief of MI6, Sir Richard Dearlove. And Sir Richard Dearlove, he had a much bigger purse. I was simply a lowly agent uh, on the, the, the ground level. He had the highest perch that you could have in intelligence in his country. And he said, point blank, that compassion, compassionate agents were the best agents because they were able to develop sources that no one could. And they were able to get information that no one could, no one could. And he says, right, in, he talks about it, uh, that waterboarding and torture, things that are very uncompassionate. And he did this and he said to never do it again. He learned with, with the IRA that when you have torture, you get the information you want, not the information you need. And man, that is a crucial wow. distinction, right? And, and we, don't, we don't step back. And people who served never want to go to war. You know the hor horrors of it, right? It's the people who've never served who are the ones that are wanting to go to war. Yep. And you know, the people who've never been in intelligence, who think that torture is, is the way you're going to get the information, you never get the information you, you need. You may get the information you want, as Sir Richard Dearlove said. Hmm. How short-sighted and how immature, right? Uh, and that's, that's kind of the dominant, dominant uh, methodology within the culture. It's just, yeah, it's just young bully boys, right? Um, and, and that's kind of like, you know, who's, who's running the, the tribe here, which is, you know, it's just kind of run amok a little bit. Man, um, we're, we're out of time. I could talk to you for days. Um, this, uh, this is a really important work. I stand by everything that you're doing here. I think it's, it's phenomenal, and I'm just, I'm, I'm honored to have had you on the show. Uh, Chris Cook, the book is called The Compassionate Achiever. I uh, highly recommend getting it, reading it, and living it. Don't just accumulate uh, more paper weight. Actually get the paper into the weight of your gray matter and, and, and make a difference here. Um, and uh, man, keep up the good work. I would love to kind of collaborate on some of these kind of grander experiments and just maybe even start like an online forum debate between different kind of polarities and just see how this plays out over over uh, uh, an interesting conversation that comes from people taking opposite positions. Like it's just, this is this is really fun. I think it's a, a part of a, a very big solution. I think you're onto something really, really uh, good and, and interesting. Man, I'll do anything with you as long as it's legal and ethical, man. I'll, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> good man. Well, listen, thank you so much. Good luck with all of it. And uh, this, is, uh, this is just the beginning. I'm going to keep calling you on stuff all the time. Let me know what you think. Get the book, read it, and apply it in your life. Dr. Pedram Shojai, The Urban Monk. I will see you next time.